Good evening, my name is James Gallagher. I will be recording this video for Professor Robertson's English 2245, British Literature After 1785. Today I'll be discussing a sonnet from the Romantic Period by Charlotte Smith, published in 1797, entitled On Being Cautioned Against Walking on a Headland Overlooking the Sea Because It Was Frequented by a Lunatic. Long title. Charlotte Smith, born in 1749, died in 1806, and while it might be too much to call her work feminist in the traditional, the way we'd use the term today, uh, much of her work dealt with very liberal political topics, and it would earn her a reprimand from the British government, placing her alongside other female authors that would sort of anger conservatives of this time period, like Wollstonecraft and Barbauld. And it is also important to keep in mind the political, social, economic landscape of this time period. It was a time of revolution and upheaval and change. And the French Revolution, the American Revolution, wasn't long ago. Um, and the Industrial Revolution, lots of changes in the workforce. Uh, the sense of impending revolution, transition, new frontier, it's a very central theme to this poem. And like I said, it's a sonnet. Uh, it's 14 lines, 10 line, 10 syllables per line, with a very strict alternating ABAB -A -B rhyme scheme that starts over every four lines. It then concludes with a couplet at the end that acts as a conclusion to the poem, and Smith sticks to this structure perfectly. And while at first uh, this structure would seem contradictory to the Romantic period because the uh, because of its rigidity, um, she's able to blend this rigid style with uh, styles and topics consistent with Romanticism, like uh, the bridge between human emotion and nature. Um, and while the sonnet was popular with early writers like Shakespeare, Dante, and Milton, um, she was able to kind of bring it back, even though in the Romantic period they were in favor of very spontaneous, unedited, emotional, organic poetry. Okay, now in the poem, we are observing a lunatic, um, a solitary wretch, as he's called in the first line, and he runs up and down a tall cliff, and he'll speak and kind of pray to this angry ocean below, sort of suggested by the word lamentation, it's a very biblical tone. Now at first he seems like a very dangerous madman, but the speaker at the end is envious of him, even say, stating that basically ignorance is bliss. Um, he's either too dumb or too innocent to really know he's supposed to be miserable by society's standards. Um, that's what felicities there is mean. Uh, means bliss. So we want to look at why she's envious and why she's being cautioned. She would be envious of his the way that he is able to escape from society and isolate himself and just totally submit to nature and this isolated natural genius was a very idealized idea in the romantic period um, the romantic poet was this archetype um, rural possibly uneducated just spontaneous submitted to nature um, and it was a very male heavy idea so therefore as a her being a woman, she was pushed away from this and not really allowed to join in the first, that explaining what she's being cautioned away from, being cautioned away from joining the other quote-unquote lunatics. Um, he's able to just jump in and fully submit to nature, but she has to stand at the headland, headland being sort of in between solid ground, rigidity, and this chaotic, changing, moving ocean. And we have lots of natural imagery. We have this, the headland. It's this halfway point between two very different worlds. This chaotic, moving, strong, violent ocean. And a very rigid, unmoving ground. Uh, we have this strong wind that's coming from the sea. And it's sighing, basically. Comparing it to like another being, like a god, that's impacting this lunatic directly. Um, chills his bed. Um, that's also why his bliss doesn't diminish it moves with the ebb and flow of the nature that he's surrounded by that's also why he's withering away like like the headland he's being eroded away by the winds and the rain okay. and we also are dealing with lots of change uh, 
the nat nature is all described in relation to each other and how they're affecting one another. Uh, the cliff is tall and overlooking relative to the ocean. This wind is a strong wind from the sea. Uh, the surf is dashing against this cliff. Um, and if we look at the OED definition of lunatic, um, it's not just someone that's crazy, it's someone that's their craziness is sort of influenced and controlled by nature, usually like moons and tides, and that would describe him perfectly. He's moving with the ebb and flow of the tide. He's sort of part of nature. Um, and this relation of all of nature together plays into this new way of seeing nature in the universe in this time period. Prior to this, uh, the universe was seen as this um, static machine, everything working together. However, now it's beginning to be seen as a living, growing, changing, dynamic universe. <clears throat> we see this because the whole poem is very active. She's not describing a, uh, a static, unmoving, natural nature scene, but a very active, a very active scene. Everything in the poem is moving. But as we can see, the only thing that isn't moving and growing and changing is the speaker. She's standing on the headland just looking on, so that's what she's envious of. So essentially Smith is presenting a portrait, sort of a snapshot, of this new this new universe, this new romantic universe of change and revolution of life, not just a static universe that her ancestors believed in. But she does this with a poetic form that was popular in a previous era. Uh, therefore, she's sort of demonstrating this transition point like the headland, this demonstration, uh, a division between these two periods, but also her feeling towards um, sexism in literature. Uh, women's writings weren't taken as seriously. She wasn't really allowed to fully join in with her contemporaries. But in the Romantic period, we start to see a lot more female authors gain popularity and literary acclaim, and so she's... Like, although she has to stand on this headland of this new period, um, she sort of sees this sea of changes that are coming. And so this poem sort of introduces us to this radically new era, um, not just through imagery, not just through images, but um, a constantly moving nature and this relation between nature and each other and it all affects one another. The ocean eroding away at the cliffs the wind chilling his bed. So this connection between humanity and nature. Thanks.